Thanks everybody for coming. It's an honor to be at this lecture and some of you travel from, from very far, so I'm very happy you're here. Um, most people in the audience have probably heard about dark matter before. I hope I'll tell you something new. Specifically, I'll talk about some of the efforts we're doing to find the dark matter particle and I would like to give you an idea of why that's difficult and challenging and how we're getting around some of the challenges. Um, I was advised to say something about how I ended up doing this, so uh, I'm going to give you a brief, brief, brief overview of where I come from, literally. Uh, this is my hometown. Uh, I grew up in the mountains in Italy. We had a river and we had a number of mountains. This is in the Alps. We're famous for sparkling water, uh, which, you know, it's not dark matter, but, you know, that works anyways. Uh, it will not surprise you to hear that I was a bit of a nerdy child growing up. Uh, those were the years of the, those was, was the heyday of the Voyager program. One of my first memories was that everybody was talking about the planets. Everybody, even on TV, even on Italian TV, or at least the two channels that had reception in the mountains. <laughs> I annoyed my family members so that somebody bought me a science book for children, and my book had a drawing pretty much like this one. Sun and planets, extremely off-scale. Um, the book explained that the, 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 the thing was not possible to draw in a book because, you know, distances are too big. I think I stared at the drawing for hours on end for like two years, three years, every day, something like that. Then in 1986, something a bit dramatic happened. I was in school at the time, and that was the Chernobyl accident. That, was, that became famous again last year because of the TV show, but most of you in the audience remember it directly. That was kind of uh, a big deal in Italy. Um, so that was the explosion of a nuclear reactor in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Union. There was a, a, a huge amount of uh, emitted radiation. There was a radioactive cloud that traveled to Europe, and some of the particles were trapped on the Alps and reached the place where I live probably not my house, but the general area. And it was a public health crisis. So at that point, we were up to four TV channels in my mountain region, and everybody was talking about atomic energy. So I wanted to know what the atoms were. And for the first time, I looked at a different page of my science book and found a drawing kind of like this one. This is a drawing of the carbon atom. It has a nucleus and six electrons. It kind of looks like the one above, and this is what we call the atomic model of the atom. It's not like accurate, it doesn't have quantum physics, then again, it's very difficult to draw quantum mechanics, especially for a children's book. <laughs> the, the fact that these two objects kind of look the same way was not lost on me, and it was actually like a mind-blowing discovery for me as a secondary grader that the smallest thing I knew, the atom, and the largest thing I knew, the solar system, had the same structure. I'm not going to tell you everything about my childhood, although I'm sure you would love to hear about it. I'm going to jump to straight 20 years. This is um, uh, me with my postdoctoral advisor and the first dark matter detector that I worked on. And in the back is uh, my colleague trying to do real work while the ladies do a photo shoot. Um, why am I showing you this? This object is what we call a particle detector. It's a technology developed to study elementary particle physics, which are the smallest, by definition, the smallest object we can study in nature. But you, we use that to study dark matter. Dark matter is a problem, is a cosmological problem. That means a problem of the whole universe. So we use this thing to study the universe, which by definition is the largest object we, we can study in nature. So I ended up doing, as Michael said, for most of my career, what I wanted to do in second grade. And I don't know if that makes me a visionary or just very stubborn, but that's what happened. So this is the introduction to tell you I'm going to talk tonight about how we use techniques from particle physics to study the universe, basically. I'm going to start by asking what is dark matter and how we know it exists. Um, so the first, the smallest cosmological scale where we can observe the um, effects of dark matter are galaxies. But to explain you galaxies, I will go back to my favorite thing, which is the solar system. This is what we call the rotation curve. In this graph, we have the mean distance from 
from sun of a given uh, uh, object of the solar system. And this is the orbital speed. This is the velocity with which the object rotates around the sun. Um, as you know, one orbit of, of the Earth is what we call one year. The orbit of Neptune is almost 200 times bigger. The orbit of Merc Mercury is, you know, a factor of 10 smaller. This is the way it's supposed to go if you have a system like the, a planetary system where all the mass is located in the center. How does that look like for a galaxy? We can measure that. Um, it's been done starting from the 60s, uh, and I will tell you a few words about the person who pioneered these kind of studies. So basically, um, we can take one galaxy. This is a photo of the triangulum galaxy, or M33. This is the distance of any star that we observe in the galaxy from the center of the galaxy. We change the scale quite dramatically. And we can see that, you know, we can do the same calculation of where the mass is and how fast the, the objects are supposed to move around the center of the galaxy. And we get a curve like this one, which is very, very similar to what we saw for the solar system because, you know, it's kind of bright in the center. We, we can imagine that all the matter is there. So the measurement was made. They, made dif they took different galaxies. They started with Andromeda starting in the 60s. And what they found was this which is very different. So basically, objects far away from the center of the galaxy are going faster than ones closer to the center. And even like out here where you, you barely see any stars, they're going faster and faster and faster. So um, I'm not going to tell you the math of this, but if you do the ratio between those two, you, between those two curves, it tells you that you're missing 90% of the mass in the system. It doesn't come from the stars. We don't see it in this in this photograph. The main person who did these original measurements is Vera Rubin. She died three years ago. Um, she started doing this in the 60s, and for decades, people thought she must not be very good at science. This must be wrong. Um, this year, breaking news, uh, we're building a big, the biggest telescope that will be built in the next decade uh, has been renamed after her, and it will be known as the Vera Rubin Observatory. So she got some delayed recognition. Okay, so galaxies are missing some matter from stars. So if we could look at the Milky Way with the dark matter eyes, we would see something like this. A bright, flat uh, circle or spiral where all the stars live and a much larger halo uh, with, I, I picture dark matter as like a foamy object, a foamy substance that kind of holds it together. Obviously, this, this kind of analogy is, is, is imperfect, so don't hold me to it. But uh, the Milky Way is estimated to have about 10 times as much dark matter as regular matter, and it would kind of look like this if we could actually see dark matter. Um, I did not define dark matter. For now, dark matter means matter is something that has a gravitational effect. We can see the gravitational effect by the way pla planets and stars move around. And uh, this is the word matter. And dark means it doesn't shine. It doesn't make stars. So then we can increase the scale a little bit and talk about galaxy clusters. This is a photo of a very nice galaxy cluster. And I'm going to come back to this photo. So galaxy clusters have hundreds of thousands of galaxies, and we can study them with a very, very cool phenomenon, which is gravitational lensing. So um, you probably heard, if not, I will tell you for the first time, which is exciting. If you have a massive object somewhere in the universe, the, the mass in the object will deform the space-time to such an extent that the shortest path for the light from like point A to B may not be the straight path, which is what we normally see with light, but will be a curve around, curve path that, you know, follows the valleys of the deformation in space-time. I wish there was an easier way to explain this. Nobody understands general relativity, but we can use it. So um, this is uh, what we call, the, the picture you saw a minute ago was an Einstein ring because, you know, that's the guy who figured this out. The interesting bit is, okay, suppose I have a galaxy cluster, and suppose I'm here on Earth looking at stuff outside. If there is a galaxy behind the galaxy cluster, uh, its light will be curved and it will hit me in a weird pattern. 
basically this curvature, the, the radio, this radius of curvature will tell me what is the mass, the total mass of the object in here, inside of the, of the galaxy cluster in the middle. So specifically, going back to our smiley face, there are two clusters here, a, gla a galaxy way far behind it, and this is the image of the galaxy behind it that is, produces what we call an Einstein ring. From the angle of this, we can figure out the mass in here, and again, the mass of the galaxy cluster is about uh, 10 times bigger than what we can uh, reconstruct from the light that's shining there. So then we can make one scale, a step, one more, you know, go up one more in size, and we go to the whole universe. How much dark matter is there in the whole universe? And we know that too. We found out exactly in 2001, I would say. Um, how do we find out? I don't know if people in the audience have seen a, a drawing like this one before. This is a sketch of the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day. So the Big Bang is the universe blew up. For a fraction of a second, it expanded a lot faster than the speed of light. It cooled down, it cooled down, it cooled down. And you know, this is us here. And at some point, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, it cooled down enough for uh, neutral atoms to form hydro the first hydrogen atoms. When that happened, light was able to escape from the hot and dense universe for the first time, and it kind of made a flash of light. And we can still see the, the, the light from that event. We call that the cosmic microwave background. It cooled down dramatically since that, that moment. This was visible light. Now we can detect it in the microwave. So if you look at the universe behind any star, any galaxy, any galaxy cluster, you will see a faint glow, and that's the leftover from the Big Bang, basically, from the first light from the Big Bang. This is what it looks like. This is a baby picture of the whole universe. This was taken by the Planck satellite in 2013. It's the oldest light in the universe, and it's been traveling for 13.8 billion years to reach us. Uh, this picture is cool, but not very informative. We have to like change the coordinates a little bit to uh, figure out the size of these small dots and the biggest regions. Sorry, I didn't tell you what the picture shows. There are regions here that are <coughs> slightly colder and slightly warmer, not by much, like factor of one in uh, 100,000. And the intensity of these, of these objects that are slightly warmer, slightly colder, and the size of these, of these small points tell us basically everything about the early universe. Specifically, they tell us what the universe is made of. And interestingly enough, the stuff that we're made of, uh, the, the, all, the, all the elementary particles that we know, are less than 5% of the total. Then there is a 30% of dark matter, and then there is a 70% of dark energy. I'm not going to explain what these two are, but basically dark means it doesn't interact with light. Matter means it pulls stuff together through gravity. And dark energy means it pushes stuff apart through, through gravity. Another way to represent this plot, which was found outside the newspaper stand in England when this data was, for, was first published, is 96% of the universe is missing. <laughs> that was another big, big uh, event. Uh, I was, I was in, I wasn't doing, doing my masters when it happened, and all of my undergrad have been told by my professors that you know, physics is almost there. We got it. We made very precise measurements. We're missing like a couple of details. On the, the standard model of elementary particle is very precise and very exhaustive. And it was kind of depressing to go into the field with that attitude because, you know, what am I going to do for a job? I need to find a real job, which was not like my pref preferred option. And then, um, and then one of the things we were missing is the whole density of the universe. That was a big question. We answered that question with a 2% precision, and we didn't know the order of magnitude. It was like a night-day change within weeks. Oh, and by the way, we don't know what it's made of. So if you find people my age or younger who work on dark matter, this, this, this has become really, really, really popular in the last 20 years. Uh, OK, fine, but what is dark matter? I'm going to start with what it is not. So this is the famous um, standard model of elementary particles. By the way, in 2001, they hadn't found the Higgs boson when they told me we have everything already. So this is a new, new plot because it has the Higgs boson. 
Uh, I'm not going, I could talk about this drawing for days, but I choose not to. Uh, maybe it will be presented at a later public talk. Uh, but I'm going to compare this drawing, this list of all the particles we know, with the properties of dark matter. Okay, dark matter interacts with gravitationally. Second feature, it's not short-lived. Short, most particles in this drawing decay within a fraction of a second. They're made and then decay, etc., etc. We know that dark matter is not short-lived because it holds the galaxies together. So you cannot do that if your particle decays, you know, 10 to the minus 25 seconds. You have to have a, a stable particle. So that gets rid of two-thirds of the particle. Then uh, it cannot be what in, um, in cosmology we call hot or in particle physics we call light, what I call slippery. Particles such as neutrinos just go through the galaxy and never stop. Uh, you cannot make a galaxy with a bunch of slippery particles. So unfortunately, we have to take out neutrinos from this graph. And then we're left with electrons and quark up and down. So electron, proton, and neutrons, which is what we're made of. And so we know it's not that one because that interacts with light. So we got rid of all the known particles, which is very excited because uh, this means there has to be a new particle. Uh, which is why most of us are in the field, and I call this job security. We found an effect that <laughs> is not explained by something that uh, we've discovered before. All right, so what do we know about dark matter? Uh, there is a lot of it, about 6 to 1, 10 to 1, 15 to 1, where you look, depending where you look. And it was formed during the Big Bang. Why during the Big Bang? Well, when do you have enough energy to make a lot, a lot of anything? That's a good time. There was almost infinite energy during the Big Bang. Cool thing, if you rewind the photo I showed you, go back and rewind the tape of the Big Bang, we sort of see it interacting with regular matter or at least exchanging energy of some form in regular matter. They were actually changing type one into the other and back and forth. So that was interesting. Okay, so then can we make it interact with regular matter again? Because then, if, if we can do that again, if we can reproduce something similar to the condition of the early universe, then we might be able to figure out what it is and what it's made of. So there are three ways where you can reproduce the conditions of the early universe in the hope of detecting the dark matter particle. Um, one is encounters in the lab. This is one of the studies that's been done at CERN, in Geneva, at a collider. You basically smash two particles together, in this case protons, they annihilate, they transform into pure energy, and then the pure energy pulls all sorts of other particles from the vacuum, um, from the void, sorry, the quantum void. And one of these particles can be a dark matter particle. So this is a photo of the LHC accelerator. This is the vacuum tube where the beam goes. And this is the photo of one of the detectors, the CMS detector. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm telling you all the ways in which we can detect dark matter. We haven't found it yet in case I, I, I hadn't said that before. So we haven't found it that way yet. Second way, you can do the reverse. You can have two dark matter particles collide and generate either energy or other particles. This is done with like telescopes from ground. Uh, this is uh, the magic telescope, I think, and, or telescopes in space. Uh, this is uh, the Fermi Space Telescope, which is one of the projects I work on, and it's in orbit above the Earth, and it hasn't found dark matter yet. Although there is controversy about some, you know, the data that, he's, that Fermi is observing from the center of the galaxy. Uh, third way, is what we call scattering, or going bump underground. So you, you create a target made of regular matter, and you hit, hope that one, one dark matter particle will hit your target of matter, of regular matter. Most of the dark matter will go through, will not interact with your target, but maybe one particle in uh, a, billion of, a billion billions will interact. Uh, this is the photo of one of those detectors. Uh, of, of these techniques that you use for to find the, to, to find dark matter in this with this method, and this is the dark side detector, which is one of the five dark matter projects I worked on. So I'm going to focus on this last technique, which is called what we call direct detection, that is detecting dark matter with interaction of nuclei on Earth. 
Uh, this is a photo of the LAX detector, which was decommissioned a couple years ago. Principle of the de detection, basically you have dark matter coming in, it will bump a nucleus or an, or an electron, but if it's an electron, it's not dark matter. So this is the recipe for a dark matter direct detector. Build a massive tank or a massive tower of nuclei. Nuclei because, ah, too complicated, I'll come back to this. Hide it deep underground and then wait for a dark matter particle to hit one of your nuclei and then you want to look for tiny vibration from <coughs> nuclei that have been hit by a dark matter particle. I said something upsetting on this slide and you should like raise your hand. Why did I say underground? Isn't it weird that I want to hide my detector underground if I'm looking for something that comes from space? So this is a photo of the atmosphere from the International Space Station. The atmosphere is extremely bright in, um, in particles. We, our eyes don't see particle, but if we have a particle detector, it's, it's really bright. This specifically is an aurora borealis uh, from space. So a lot of particles come from the sun, interact with the atmosphere and glow. Particles normally don't glow, but they're all over the place at all times. And I would like to make a live demonstration if this is successful. Please bear with me. This is a Geiger counter. Um, it's the most rudimental particle detector. Do you hear it? Can you guys hear it? It's not doing what I want it to be doing, which is one particle per second, but you know, a bit irregular. This stuff comes from the sun. Basically, it interacts with the atmosphere and we can pick it up. We don't normally see it because our eyes only see photons, that is light, not particles, but that's what it does. Specifically, the particles we just heard are called muons. Uh, there is stuff that comes from the sun, from the galaxy, from outside the galaxy. It interacts with the atmosphere, it makes other particles, other particles. The stuff that reaches the surface is, is this particle called muon. It's like they have a cousin of the electron. We don't need to know about it details. But there is a lot of them. On the surface, we are continually hit, continuously hit by those particles. But if you put your experiment under a mountain, those things will be absorbed by the mountain, and then whatever makes it you know, a couple miles under the mountain will be not immune, so the thing you're looking for. Dark matter is very elusive, so it doesn't care if there is a mountain, it doesn't care if there is a planet, it just goes through. Um, this is what, where we put LZ, our experiment, which I'm going to tell you about. It's buried a mile underground in a former homestake mine in uh, Leeds, South Dakota. If you've seen the Deadwood TV show, that's where it happened. The, the, the mine was decommissioned uh, 10 years ago, and, that's, and now it's a science lab. Like I said, I'm going to talk about this experiment. The name is LZ or Lux Zeppelin, it's an acronym of acronyms. It's a very bad name, I didn't pick it, please don't hold this against me. <laughs> so, the thing we heard earlier, like one per square centimeter per second, approximately, is what we call muons, and that's the flux at the Earth's surface. So, one per square centimeter per second. This drawing, this plot, is a, is a chart of all the different underground laboratories in the world we, 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 because they have different rock composition, we, make, we, we convert everything to water, and this is how deep they are in water. So this is one millionth of the surface flux, and uh, the surf experiment, I forgot to put the label, I'm so sorry. Surf, the, the home stake, the, the lab is up here, and this, the, the flux is about 15 per square centimeter per, se per century. So it's a factor of 200 million reduction. So, low enough that it, it, the, the residual muons will not bother us. Uh, this is what the site looks like. They started digging from the surface, then they realized that the goal was elsewhere, so they built a, a network of tunnels. It goes as deep as six miles underground. This is what we call the head frame, which is where the cable runs, and the cable you know, is a few miles long, and it moves things and people and gold. And, particle detectors up and down. This is the head frame. Uh, this is a gold uh, ingot from, from the mine from a few years ago. They switched to gold in the 90s and they shut it down in the mid-2000s. 
And it's a very, very interesting place to visit. Growing up in Europe, I had an idea what America would be like. Then I came here and it was like, you know, it's cities and stuff. But if you want to find the Wild West, it's still there in like the middle of South Dakota. The people who have been there are nodding very vigorously. Yes, there is the buffalo, the prairie, all of that, and you know, the Western type of things. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of physics now. How does the detector work, the Lux Zeppelin detector? It's a bucket of liquid xenon. I'm gonna tell you in a second why liquid xenon. It has, um, we're basically, I'm, I'm giving, you, giving away the lead, we're basically in, uh, detecting the matter through light. So it's a bucket of liquid xenon, there is a particle coming here, it bumps one of the atoms, this, this bump makes some light and some electrons, we apply an electric field top and bottom and we extract the electrons and then the photosensors observe the light, the first one and second one. I have a movie, if you haven't heard me the first time I have a movie. Uh, and then the particle goes down. So bucket of liquid xenon. The movie is not playing, panic. Okay, this is a, my dark matter particle. It bumps on the, on the xenon and makes light and light is detected up and down by the photosensor arrays that are on the two sides. Then we apply an electric field, and some of the energy is released in the form of electrons. The electrons travel, 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 go to the top. On the top, there is a thin layer of gas, a, a intense electric field, and they make more light. So that's how it works. We have two lights coming out of the interaction, and I'm gonna come back to that at the very end of this talk. So why xenon and why a liquid? So this is an incandescent tube, uh, a discharge tube filled with xenon gas. Uh, you see here it's um, purple, bluish. Most of the xenon light is actually uh, in the ultraviolet and we cannot see it, but there is some that can be seen. So it's used, for example, to make incandescent light. It's used for fancy halogen lights. If you have an expensive car, it is likely that your uh, head uh, so your light headlight will be will have some xenon in them. So this is like probably the most difficult concept I'm gonna say tonight. So xenon is really good for dark matter because of what we call kinematic matching. So if you are studying an object and you cannot look at it with your eyes, you want to throw stuff at it. But the important thing in the, the, is that the thing you throw at it has to be pretty much the same size. So if I want to study an object like this and I cannot use my eyes, I may think, oh, I'm gonna throw a cannonball at it. Well, you will destroy, destroy the object, but not really study it. But if you're three years old, you know exactly what to do, which is this, especially if your parents never told you not to touch things. <laughs> this is very important. The fingers of the three years old are the same size as the flower, and so then it's a good kinematic match into the object you're studying. So we think that the xenon nucleus has roughly the same size of a large class of dark matter particles that we think is likely uh, a good model for what we see in the universe. Uh, then it has a lot of nucleus per atom. Nucleons is a, is a word that says protons plus neutrons. It has about 130. This is a drawing, representation, planetary model, incorrect, please forgive me. Of the xenon atom, we have 130 points in here and then 54 electrons. Uh, we think that the dark matter interacts with regular matter with, via the nuclear weak interaction. Nuclear says it only interacts with the nucleus, not with the electrons, and weak says this is very, very infrequent, which explains why we hardly ever see it. Uh, the other thing that I already said, it makes light and the light escapes. This is a drawing, uh, a representation of all the uh, Nobel, li Nobel liquids. There are a number of Nobel elements in the periodic table. I would like to talk about this for days, but we don't have days. Mm -hmm. Each one has a different color, helium, neon, etc. They're all, they all like, they make light and they are transparent to their own light, which means they make light, but then you have a chance of detecting it with the photosensor. Then these two things, it's very dense and can do background rejection. Those are kind of technical and they are the last two things I'm gonna tell you in this talk. And that is kind of cool that you have a liquid because if it's a liquid, you can take it out of the detector and purify it and filter and put it back. And we purify these things continuously. And this one is my favorite, which is it's relatively easy to make a larger detector. 
is easy in scary qu scare quotes. It's not that easy, but you know, first approximation, if you want to go from a 10 kilogram detector to a 10,000 kilogram detector, you just make a bigger bucket. If you have to make it with solid state detectors with a crystal, you have to build 10,000 crystals instead of 10, which is kind of challenging. So this is the construction of the first detector that I showed you earlier, the 10 kilogram detector in 2006. Um, so then scaling up by a factor of a thousand took about 13 years, which is quite remarkable in any scientific te technique. Uh, this is a fun graph that I like to show. Most of you will be familiar with Moore's law, which says computing power doubles every year, then it went to every two years. This is way faster than that. Uh, this is where I started my career from, and this is where we're going to be next year, which is 100 times, 100,000 times improvement. A thousand times come from the mass, the extra 100 comes from making the experiment better, and that is what I will tell you from the rest of this talk, or in the rest of this talk. What time is it? 8 or 5, we're probably okay. So, I showed you a first step is to build a massive tank of nuclei, and I will tell you the recipe. Uh, first of all, whatever you do, take a lot of pictures so you can show your friends and colleagues and family. First element is photosensors. Um, like I said, we need to detect the light. These things are very big in the photo, but they're about three inches across. They, they are very weird. They work in liquid. They are electrical devices. They work at high voltage, but they work in liquid and they work in cold. So xenon is only liquid at approximately negative 200 Fahrenheit. We had, it, it took 20 years to like develop the technique to detect light in, light in liquid and cold and not be radioactive, etc. A company did it, we just bought it from them and we bought a lot of them, like a lot of them, a <laughs> little bit more, a little bit more, twice as many, so like 500 of these. Uh, okay, this is your photosensor that you saw earlier in the drawing. Then we need to build the actual bucket. The actual bucket, uh, we build modularly. We started here with like a four inch object. And obviously you want to make it of highly reflective material because the goal here is to detect the light from the interactions. Uh, like I said, modularly, we stacked um, modules of this, of this object. This is Teflon, PTFE. Teflon is very reflective, as you can see, because it appears white. It's very reflective to regular light, but it's freakishly highly reflective to ultraviolet light, especially in liquid, especially in xenon. We don't exactly know how that happens, but the reflectivity that you see from this picture is 70 to 80 percent. In ultraviolet light in liquid xenon, it's like 98 or 99 percent. We don't understand the atomic physics or why that happens, but that's like one of the big reasons why the entire field works, that this thing is freakishly reflective. Then you start stacking things, and then a little bit more, and then you you're happy every time you go up a little bit more, and then you go up a little bit more, and almost almost there. Okay, then I told you earlier that we, ap we have to apply an electric field, and you do that by building electrodes. So the electrodes were built here at SLA. They were woven, and um, this object is a loom, is a literal loom. Our engineer went to the weaving club of Sunnyvale to learn how to build a loom, and we've, we weaved, woved, uh, sorry, we weaved a, a mesh of stainless steel. These wires are about 100 micron each and they're spaced like five millimeters. So you, you don't see the wires there, but if you put a bright object in the background, you can see them there, like 100 micron each, and it's like, you know, a, a mesh of stainless steel. Make four of these, ship them to South Dakota, build a box that keeps everything straight and everything aligned because it's 100 micron thick, thin, and uh, yeah, thin or thick, and can be the form. You send your favorite students and your favorite postdocs to unpack it, or just not favorite, the ones you're kidding. Uh, <laughs> I want to say mean things about these guys, but they're, they're pretty great. So then you unpack it, bring a few more colleagues, and then you put the whole thing together. So first you put the grids, what we call the grids, the electrodes, on top of the photosensors array. Uh, again, you cannot really see it, but if you zoom here on one of the photosensors, you see the thing on top. And then excitement, and then you put the photocenter sort array on top and on the bottom of the bucket. And we have video, this took, you know, maybe a little over a day. We have a crane, and, you know, 
This gets lifted with the crane and it gets put on the top and take picture, that's very important. And also a video, et cetera, et cetera. All right, then you, so we, we covered it in foil during assembly so that we don't get it dirty or damage it accidentally. Take out the foil and take more pictures. That was a big day for everybody in photography. So you see here the bucket, uh, photo sensor array on top and bottom, lots of cables. And then you expect it with ultraviolet light and make sure it's really, really clean. This took another couple of days. And I'm gonna make a break here and take a break here, half time show, I'm gonna talk about radioactivity and then we come back to construction. Uh, you've seen that everybody's wearing clean room suits and two pairs of gloves, you, you can only see one, but the two pairs of gloves, mask, hair net, et cetera. Why are we doing that? So everything is radioactive. You probably heard that if you eat a banana, it's about 15 becquerels of radioactivity because bananas have potassium. Potassium is good for you. If you don't have enough potassium, your heart will stop. But also a very, very small fraction of the potassium in nature is radioactive. Uh, humans are radioactive. As you know, we can find how long something has been dead by measuring its carbon-14 content. This still comes from the sun. sun the Radioactivity from the sun interacts with nitrogen in the atmosphere, makes a little bit of radioactivity. Plants take the radioactive carbon and if we eat plants, or if we eat an animal that eat, eats plant, we ingest carbon-14, which then decays case in 5,000 years, and that's how you know how long something has been dead. Uh, but also in organic matter, is radioactive. This is an example of stock photo of steel piping. Everything, the, the earth, the sun blew up before the current sun that we have now, so we have all sorts of elements, including some radioactive ones, and specifically uranium, thorium, and um, potassium, which are all like, radioactive, but they live very, very, very long life. They, have, they live longer than the sun, actually, and there are traces of these elements in anything that you take out from the Earth. So then, um, everything is radioactive. I've said earlier that the interactions from dark matter are extremely uh, rare and we must, must control the radioactivity of the detectors because everything that's, that, we, that we build is going to be radioactive. I'm going to make two examples. The average human is 100 times more radioactive than a dark matter detector per pound. If you buy steel, the commercial steel that comes from the earth is going to be 200 times more radioactive than the titanium that we chose to build the bucket that contains the bucket. I'm gonna show you the titanium in a second. We had to work with, actually with the company to develop a special type of the titanium that will be distilled before actually making the ingot, which is kind of crazy to make it pure enough. So problem here is that we don't get to choose uh, the rock in the homestake mine. The mine, mine is, was already there. We went and bothered it with our detector. So we didn't get to choose the, the, the material. So everything that we can choose is super clean. And for the mine, we do this. This is the detector I showed you earlier, the white one, one which is about uh, five feet tall. And then we put it in concentric, uh, in concentric uh, cylinders of detectors. So there is one out here, which is drawn in green. This is, we call it a scintillator. This scintillator contains gadolinium. And gadolinium is an element that is very good at trapping neutrons. So if we have neutrons coming from outside from the rock, they will be trapped by this guy. And then there is a large water tank that is basically a buffer and absorbs radioactivity from the rock. Did I say something wrong, guys? Um, I'm looking at my colleagues with like mild concern. Uh, <laughs> so then I said there is a titanium, so first thing, the, the bucket is containing another other bucket which is made of titanium, as I just said. And we can go back to the assembly video, I have another video, that's the last one, of uh, putting the, the thing here, the big detector inside this titanium bucket. These require cranes, I think we did it in three days, everybody was wearing harnesses so that they wouldn't accidentally fall in the hole because safety first. Then we had guides, obviously people taking pictures, and then alignment, alignment, insertion, and it, it was a very tight fit because if you have extra space out here, it decreases your, the sensitivity of your detector. Then it got stuck here, as you can see. There was a lot of swearing and cursing and then <laughs> rebuilding, coming back the next day, and then it finally was inserted. 
So there we go. It's in its bucket. Then we put the lid on, we seal it, and we are very happy and say thumbs up. So this is the detector in its inner titanium, what we call cryostat. Cryostat is a double wall metal object, like a thermos for your coffee. And then we, put, we bring it to the mine. All the assembly was done on the surface in South Dakota, but on the surface because it's kind of hard to work in the mine, but then we have to bring it down. So we roll it to the side and pack it. We chose a snow day because, of course, and then we put it on forklift and drive it, drive it to the head frame. This is what the head frame looks like. And we suspended uh, the whole, the packet detector on a, on a rope that is, you know, a few miles long and then lower it very slowly. Two words of mining terminology, a vertical corridor is called the shaft and horizontal corridor is called the drift. So we sent it down the shaft. When you send humans down here, you put them in, in a literal cage, it's called the cage. And it takes about 10 minutes. When you put something so delicate, it takes two hours because you don't want to bump the object. If you bump the humans, no, nobody cares. Just kidding, safety first. <laughs> uh, so then it gets down, it goes back on its side, and it gets like transferred to the drifts. And it, the, the, the drifts are progressively cleaner where you get to the lab, and it's a very tight fit. So I told you earlier how many people, how many photo sensors, okay, this many, okay, stop here. How tall, okay, stop here. Why did, how did we know where to stop? Basically, we build the biggest object that could go through the drifts and into the shaft. That's kind of how we designed the detector. Uh, and that's it, this is it on top of the water tank of the big shielding object. Everybody very happy. It will go down through this flange and this is the inside of the water tank with the postdoc waiting for the detector to be lowered. Those transparent boxes are where the scintillator will go. So once the, the inner detector is installed, we rotate these things, we put them around the inner detector and then fill everything with other scintillator or, back, or water. So almost there. I said a few times dark matter is extremely elusive. There are about three dark matter particles per liter on Earth depending on the mass, but like, give me order of magnitude. So show and tell this object contains three dark matter particles at all time. This includes your bodies, by the way. So uh, part pa three particles per liter, no matter what liter. They're streaming through the Earth at 150 miles per second, approximately, including your head. So I hope this is not upsetting. They will not interact with the inside of your head. Uh, there are almost 10,000 particles inside the Z, my detector that I showed you, at any given time, and it, they will go through the volume in something like 10 milliseconds, 10 millionth of a second. So, 1 billion particles go through the detector every second. Of those 1 billion particles, we're hoping to see maybe one per year if we're lucky and nature cooperates. So, that's what I mean by extremely elusive. So, then the question will be, uh, how does that compare to background? Because everything is radioactive. So uh, I said we get a 200 million reduction by going underground. And then we build everything with as clean as we can. Uh, so we, our detector is between 100 times and 1 million times cleaner than regular stuff. The residual expected particles after you take these steps are going to be five billion, 1 billion a year, or 50 per second. Of those, dark matter is one of the one billion. So it's like an extreme needle in a haystack problem. And you know, this is if we're lucky, if nature cooperates, that we have one in one billion. So how are we going to distinguish those? Uh, hopefully not this, <laughs> not this way. All right, so this is how the way we designed the detector comes to our help. Uh, first of all, this is the detector bucket. If a particle comes from an object that's, that emits radioactivity, it will interact a bunch of times in the Xeno. It will interact here and here and here, and we'll have a, a, a jagged path. Is that the word in English? Am I making this up? If the dark matter particle it interacts, it will not interact. But if it does, it will interact only once. So the probability of this is, sorry, powers of 10, I shouldn't say this, 10 to the minus 17. The, per, the probability of this is 10 to the minus 34. It's a number way to say pretty much impossible. So 
If I throw out from my 5 billion events everything that interacts more than once, I have a 95% rejection of stuff that I know comes from radioactivity. So I'm down to 250 million already. Then what do I do? I, I look at um, how everything deposits energy in my detector. This plot is very crowded. Uh, we, I'm saying I, I don't expect, I expect the public to understand it. I don't really understand it either, although I made it. Uh, this is the, the, the deposited energy in the detector. And all of this comes from detector components, from the rock, from uh, contamination, radioactive contamination of the xenon itself. So we're gonna look in this region here, which is a bit less crowded, and also not only does, does dark matter interact very rarely, but when it does, it leaves very little energy. So we zoom this region and we look at the energy deposits. And again, there is a quiet region down here. So we only look down here. And this is 0.4% of the events that end up in this, in this region. And this is, this is, you know, nothing above here will be a dark matter particle, and this is more quiet. Sorry if this was confusing. Um, then we want to see some charge from those events to make sure that it's not an electric emission from those electrodes because we're bringing 100 kilovolt inside the liquid in the cold. So you may have like electric discharge emitted. So you want to know that this is a particle event and not just an electrical phenomenon. And this throws out 90% more events. Then I told you earlier that the xenon is extremely dense. Specifically, it has 54 electrons per atom. So everything that has electromagnetic interaction, when it comes to the, to the detector, will interact with those electrons because there is a lot of an extremely dense liquid xenon is like three kilograms per liter, which doesn't mean anything but aluminum floats on it. So it's very, very dense. So everything will stop here. It's basically a wall made of, made of its material. So if I throw out the external 20% of the volume by figuring out with the, where the interaction happened, I get rid of 95% uh, of whatever is there of, of the radiation. I know that the dark, and I get like a quiet region in the center. So I can go in here and find the quiet region. Then I told you that one of my outer detectors, one of my external buckets, is made of scintillator that uh, traps neutrons. Interestingly enough, um, so when a neutron hits here, it will probably hit another time. So then if I turn on this detector and throw out all the events that had more than one interaction, including the neutron detector, what happens is this. So that this region be, be inside the shaded line is very, very quiet. So I'm gonna look for dark matter there. This throws out another 20%. All of these are order of magnitude, and if I change the order, the fractions are gonna be different. So don't quote me, don't, don't make your own dark matter paper with those numbers. It's like orders of magnitude. Then I remind you that the, elect the particle that comes in has two lights, one that is direct light and one that is from the extracted electrons. So it's charge, it's, it's basically from the electrons. So the reason why we use liquid xenon or liquid argon is that a dark matter particle will have an amount, a 50-50 distribution of light that comes out first and light that comes out second. For everything else, most of the energy is deposited in the form of electrons, so the second flash of light will, be, will have a lot more light than the, the first flash of light. So we decide that, you know, for an electron, this will be 100 times bigger or 2,000 times bigger for a dark matter particle, it will be the same size. So I throw this out, and this is 99.5% good at rejection, rejecting non-dark matter, and so we end up with five events out of five billion. Uh, this is, you know, I said the recipe, it's kind of like uh, labor intensive and resource intensive. We do, uh, we write a lot of data, one petabyte per year, and of that, like one kilobyte is dark matter, and then, we need a lot of computing to analyze that. This is the CORI supercomputer and NERSC, which is what we use for, for this data analysis. And obviously, you don't only need computers, you need people. This is a photo of the members of the LZ collaboration in South Dakota, outside the mine. Uh, we have about 250 between uh, engineers and students and scientists. Some of them are here, about 15 of them are here. I will introduce them at the very end. 
So that's how you really do it. It's not just the computer. So uh, this is a map of all the underground labs in the world. There are about 30 to 40 detectors looking for dark matter in this with techniques similar to the one I described at any given time. And um, spoiler alert, we haven't found it yet, but this is a worldwide effort and a lot of people are working on it. This is a photograph of the Milky Way galaxy from New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is because we, we cannot see the galactic center from here, from the northern hemisphere. And it's around here, the galactic center. It, it has, there is gas in front of it, so you don't really see it. But most of what you see in this picture it, is dark matter, but we don't really see it. And to me, that's kind of annoying a little. It is hiding. Most of the universe, is, most matter in the universe is dark, and it is hiding in plain sight at all times. Uh, like I said, we haven't found it yet. It's been, been working on it for 30 years. If somebody, some young person um, in the audience wants to figure out what to do as adults, we might still be looking for this in 20 years. Hopefully not. If not, maybe we find it with, the, with this detector that I presented, and then we have a big party. Thank you for listening. Okay, we have time for questions. Um, raise your hand, uh, be recognized. All of you have microphones in front of you. So before you ask your question, just turn on the microphone, the little button in front of you, and then you can be heard, and also you'll be heard on the recording. So who would like to ask a question? Um, Ma'am. Can you list the theorized dark matter particles? I'm glad you asked. This is a selection of the theorized dark matter particles. This is about seven years old, so there are probably more than that. And just for context, I don't even know which one we're looking for. Where is the wimp here? I don't see it. Top left. Wimps in that plot. I think you're right. I should have looked at it. It's somewhere around here. So we're looking for one of these particles, and there is a lot, lot more. This is an e partial. Yes, there is, this is a par partial list of dark matter particles as of 2013. But only one person can be right. So we can't, we can't detect it because, well, we have a difficult time detecting it because uh, uh, it doesn't interact with matter. But we have detected it because uh, it, it has gravity. Uh, and we have these dark holes, uh, 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 black holes, <laughs> sitting in the middle of all these galaxies and no Einstein rings, no interaction at all. I mean, uh, are there, is there a way that people have explained that we can't see it uh, by those kinds of mechanisms? Thank you for asking this. So uh, it's very hard to see a black hole. If we had a lot of black holes in the galaxy, we would see them because we would observe stuff that is falling onto them. So one of the big hypotheses in the 80s and 90s was the so-called MACHOS, Massive Halo Compact Objects. And we did a survey and figured out that in the galaxy, in our the region around our galaxy, we didn't have enough of those to explain the missing factor of 10 in the galaxy. Then uh, the black hole hypothesis, hypothesis came back again a few years ago after the detection of discovery of gravitational waves because we had intermediate scale black holes, 30 solar masses falling onto each other, and we started wo wondering how many are there really. In the beginning, it we seemed like we had a lot of them. We don't really know the actual number because we've seen a hand, handful of these events so far. I think it got popular and, and went away again. So we, we, the, the consensus, again, consensus and not certainty, is that for what we know about black holes, there aren't enough to explain all the effects that we see and all the effects that we see at the different scales. So they have to be able to explain 
what they see in the galaxy, what they see in galaxy clusters, what, they, what we see in the whole universe. So we, we don't think that there, are, there, are, there is enough of them. Am I saying this right? People tell me if I'm not. A couple of experiments in Italy have claimed to detect some particle they thought was dark matter. What do you think it is? What do I think it is? Okay, uh, first of all, it's, uh, you know, I'm Italian, I don't want to get killed with what, <laughs> this is being recorded, right? Um, first of all, different experiments, so this hypothesis, this happened like at when the density of the universe was me measured same year. Um, one experiment claimed they saw something that can, an effect that could be provoked, caused by the dark matter particle, then like 30 other experiments looked for the same effect and didn't see anything. Um, you can find a model that accommodates exclusion from those experiments and evidence from the first one. The only way to rule it out forever would be to remake it with the same material in the same lab with the same technique, and there are efforts around the world to do that. There have been hundreds of papers to explain what the thing that the DAMA experiment sees the important bit here is that um, what I showed in this drawing, which is the ability to, to distinguish dark matter from radioactivity, that is not possible in the DAMA experiment. So this can literally be anything. If you want me, if you want me to say my favorite crackpot theory of what this is, is the water in the Gran, Gran Sasso mountain is very porous and the water level comes up and down, and it's kind of synchronized with the annual modulation that we see with dark matter, and water is a neutron moderator. Can it do that, that or not? I haven't done the calculations, I should. There are, like I said, there are hundreds of papers, and the Dhamma people would say that uh, what, what I just said is wrong, and it's been proven to be wrong, and I'm not a theorist. My way of checking this is to build another detector and see if I see the same thing. I don't know if this is a answers your question. It helps. Turn your microphone off. Oh, sorry. OK, so I was wondering, um, so there are so many theories about the dark matter, right? So how do people decide uh, which one do I want to follow and spend you know, millions of uh, dollars to build a detector? So two, two ways. One is we. Uh, you know the comic of like the drunk person looking for his skills under the, uh, the street light and his friend says, is this where you lost your keys? And the answer is, I don't know, but that's where light is. So we're looking for dark matter interactions using the weak interaction. Why do we do that? A, because we know how to do it. B, because if you rewind the clock of the Big Bang and see when dark matter in the present density was formed, you get to a temperature which is roughly, or was a few years ago, roughly the same scale as the weak interaction. That's why it got exciting. So there are those, those two reasons, because we can and because it might be a possibility. Uh, if you're very creative and have ideas, there are other um, experiments looking in other place of this, and I think we, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. And I think we're expanding the search in other, what we call other parts of the parameter space. If you're very creative and can tell me how to find action light particles have ideas, uh, I don't know. No, 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 I saw it, but I'm like, I'm looking for something that we don't know, cue balls. If you have an idea on how to look for cue balls, that would be great. And, but you know, there is a process starting here for the next, you know, all over the US, collecting ideas for the next 10 years on how to look for some of those other models. So normal matter is um, organized in, in galaxies and uh, in black holes. Um, is this also from the gravitational um, pool you can see, is this also true for dark matter or is it very uniformly distributed? We think that dark matter follows kind of, it's the other way around. Matter started to condense in regions of the universe that were seeded by dark matter density. So basically, the sh baby picture of the universe I showed you, 
is very uniform. It's uniform in like, I'll, I'll, except for one part in 100,000. With that level of uniformity, it's very hard to make a large scale structure to see what will become a cloud of gas that then will become a star or a galaxy. So we think that because dark matter doesn't work, doesn't, doesn't interact with radiation in the same way as you know, the star we saw in the picture did, it started making clumps way earlier than anything else. So it started making clumps you know, years after Big Bang, not, not hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years. So then it started making clumps. So while everything else was, was expanding, the regular matter started falling on top of the pre-existing dark matter clumps, basically. So dark matter started making the aggregation and everything else started falling on it. What role does dark matter play in the formation of galaxies and does it interact with other dark matter particles? So yes, the, f the answer to the first one is what I just said. So clumps of dark matter form very, very, very early in the, in the history of the universe and regular matter followed. So basically dark matter seeded the formation of stars and the formation of galaxies. And the other one is, um, we think dark matter interacts with other dark matter. One of the uh, models in this thing, although it, it may not be labeled that way, is called the self-interacting dark matter. So if the dark matter has the weak interaction, it will interact with itself, obviously, besides regular matter. And if not, we still have models of the dark matter interacting with itself, but not with regular matter. And you know, the so-called self-interacting dark matter explains some of the things we see outside in the galaxy that uh, may or may not be explained by, by like the, the, the standard dark matter model, which is what I talk mostly about tonight. So probably, we think so. What happens when you finally discover dark matter? Uh, I'll be very happy. I will have a big party. Maybe somebody in this room will, be, will win the Nobel Prize, not me, but maybe that person will bring all their colleagues to Stockholm. Uh, what happens in terms of regular life? I don't know, maybe 100 years from now or 500 years from now. We will not take the power from like nuclear physics. We will not like switch on the light using you know electromagnetism. We will switch it on using dark matter. That I do not know. It's like way. It's decades or centuries away. Um, the universe will be a lot less annoying to me. It's personally is is very irritating <laughs> that we have a very very comprehensive and detailed model of elementary particle physics and all their interactions. And that explains less than 5% of the total. <laughs> Maria Erlina, can I take this one also? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm, so I'm a particle theorist, so I have an interest in this problem. Um, I, it, it's not, I'm one of those people who doesn't feel like annoyed by the universe that we don't know what dark matter is. <laughs> but the dark matter particle, as Maria Elena explained, would be something completely outside of our current theory of particle physics. So it's like you knew about electrons, but you didn't know about protons and neutrons. Well, now you know that there's a proton. And probably there's something else out there that contains that, which would be a whole new set of interactions in physics. And a whole piece of the, if you like, grand unified picture of what the fundamental forces are. So it would open a door, and we could walk through that door, and who knows what's on the other side. More questions? Okay, more questions. Let's have two more. Um, given that we understand that um, uh, dark matter interacts with gravity, and given that we know that uh, black holes have lots of gravity, and we know that there's 10x more uh, dark matter than regular matter, we can assume that dark black holes are consuming a lot 
of dark matter. Is there um, detection mechanisms, either at the event horizon or at the um, massive amount of dark matter being consumed, that allow us to better detect and understand dark matter at these interfaces? This is extremely interesting. I never thought about it, but we see, we know that, that black holes exist because we see stuff falling onto it. And the way we see stuff falling onto it is with electromagnetic interaction. So I don't know, I, I, everything that we've done wouldn't work for dark matter so far. But please, if you have an idea, that's, that, that, is, that, that would be excellent. That would be a great thing to do. Um, does dark matter exist in every galaxy or have any galaxy without dark matter being discovered? There are no galaxies without dark matter. There are multiple galaxies with no regular matter or very little regular matter. So there are galaxies with more than 99% dark matter and less than 5% the total. But no, that would be a massive, massive discovery if we found galaxies without dark matter and we haven't found it. That would, that would prove that we are not understanding how this works. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Maria Lenny here.